Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Hi, I'm Curtis Wong from MSR Next Media, and I want to thank you for coming to this talk by Hyun Lee. Uh, let me give you a brief background for those of you that didn't see your background. Hyun has a bachelor's degree in fine arts from RISD as well as a uh, bachelor's in industrial design. She comes with a, um, a master's degree in interaction design from Carnegie Mellon as well as a PhD from the Media Lab and recently defended her thesis with uh, the committee of Glor Gloriana Davenport, uh, Gordon Gordon Bell and uh, Bill Mitchell. Um, Hyun has an interesting background in terms of she's lived in a lot of places around the world. She was originally born in Panama, lived in the Canary Islands, spent time in Mexico, lived in Africa and Swaziland, and uh, of course, uh, as well as spending time at the different colleges in Providence and Boston as well. I think you'll find her talk on uh, storied experiences pretty interesting. Let me introduce Hyun. Thanks for coming. Hi. Thank you. So uh, glad to be here. So today I thought I'd talk to you about how one day everyday objects, systems, and future artifacts can tell us stories. So that one day we can make sense of our experiences. So actually I was on the plane when the Super Bowl was happening last night. And uh, the captain would tell us intermittently who was winning. and so. Imagine if there was a system that actually can tell me a story about the football game, about the Super Bowl. You know, you can actually go to the evening news and see highlights or, you know, what the sports editor might think about uh, the game. But what if the system can actually, you know, really reveal the energy of the team or the strategy that went behind the turning point of the Colts game last night? Imagine another scenario where, you know, you're on a camping trip with your friend. You know, everyone has that shot where you put the camera to your face. But imagine if these devices had capabilities of sharing their point of view so that you have a fuller experience of what's happening in that point in space. And then imagine an auction house, you know, the Stradivarius violin. Imagine if it started to play the music from centuries ago. How would that change the value of the object? And then, you know, in a very different scenario, how do businesses actually implement stories of their products into our lives so that the next time I go to a supermarket, you know, which product will I buy? So story is actually about exchange. Exchange is about two-way communications. It's, it's about communicating a sequence of events that are woven together in an interesting way for people. So by the end of the talk, Hopefully you'll understand how we can actually think about including story making into design thinking so that you know, we can create this man and machine partnership so that you know, it can support the story exchange between people for a deeper understanding. So when I think about story, I think about movies, I think about my grandmother telling me stories when I was a little girl. So the story process essentially involves the listener and the teller. And what's important about it is that storytelling in itself is about telling. But actually, it's only about 20%. The other 80% about storytelling is actually about listening. So you know, what I'm doing right now, I'm trying to tell a story about, you know, my research. And, but at the same time, I'm reading your gesture too. So there's that essentially this feedback loop. So the idea is that the same story told will never be the same again. Because each context and each point that you bring into the context is different. So my problem space is how do we create objects? How do we create environments? How do we create systems that support the story exchange? And so I've articulated a storage framework and how we can think about story with design. And my approach is in design so that 
I'm taking a very object-centric view of the world so that I'm looking at how objects can use their history to tell stories about their life. So what do we gain by putting history into objects? And you know, what does it mean when objects tell stories about their life? So I'm gonna tell you a little story about this rocker. It's a JFK rocker. So about this time last year, this uh, rocking chair was auctioned off for $96,000 at Sotheby's to a London bidder. And if you actually follow the history of objects, there's this notion called the provenance of the object, which is a record of ownership. And when you actually look at the chair, this record is not apparent. It's actually a separate document. So the provenance actually lists you know, the ownership. So at one point, President Kennedy, you know, he was listed as probably the primary owner of the rocker. And then last year, you can probably see this anonymous bidder who bought it for $96,000. So what I did was, well, you know, is there something more interesting th than this record? How can we expand this notion of provenance of an object? So apparently, President Kennedy met this rocker at his Dr. Travell's office. Uh, he actually had a really bad back. And so he first sat on it, and it really supported his back. Uh, it supported his feet and arms, and it had the southern look that he really liked. So he said, I really want to take this rocker from your office. But you know, basically, she said, no way. You know? <laughs> but she pointed to where he can buy one. So in the late 50s, uh, he was pointed to the PMP family uh, furniture company, and he bought it for $35. And he took it to the Capitol Hill when he was a senator. So actually when he was in Capitol Hill, this is when actually the rocker w became really famous because the furniture movers came in and said, okay, President Kennedy, what do you want us to take to the White House? And he says, well, let's leave everything for the next senator, but you know, I want my rocker. And so this I want my rocker got you know, leaked to the press. And ever since then, the rocker was forever you know, linked to Kennedy. So you, you can actually find illustrations, political cartoons uh, about JFK and the rocker. So in the White House, you can imagine, you know, all these events that happen around the chair, right? His children running around the Oval Office, the ambassadors or the other dignitaries who visit him, and all the stress or the calmness when he's reading books. So because he really liked this chair, what he did was he bought an additional 14 chairs to put around the uh, White House. And then in addition to that, basically when a dignitary visited him at the White House, he gave one as a present. So you can imagine you know, the dispersing of all these uh, the identical rockers in different parts of the world now. And that they are starting to really starting to imagine and witness their history. So after his tragic death, um, all, all the artifacts, including this rocker, was uh, passed on to uh, Onassis. And then after her death, all the artifacts were passed to uh, their daughter, uh, Caroline Kennedy. And so in her biography, uh, she basically took what was meaningful for her, and the rest, um, they built a museum in Massachusetts about the JFK. And they put, there, there's an exhibition there where they put a lot of artifacts that was owned by him. And the rest, she auctioned it off through Sotheby's. And this is where this anonymous bidder, who was a Greek ship owner, bought it for $96,000. So if you want a rocker, you can buy it today at the museum for $300. So the point of the slide is that when you look, look at the rocker, you know, first we knew that, sure, it was owned by JFK, and la later, recently, it was you know, auctioned off. But what about all these other events that surround it? How can we think about really, you know, including all these events within the object so that they could tell their stories about their life? Now, JFK is socially significant, right? But what happens about my chair or your chair or any other object in your house? You know, what is the everydayness? You know, what would it tell about my life when I sit on my computer chair every day? So it's the idea that we need to really expand this notion of provenance, that not only does it you know, capture the records of ownership, but it expands to capture the everyday.
So what we've articulated so far is that the current state of the history of objects is really separated. I should use this. Is really separated from the object, right? And so what we want to do is we want to combine the history into the object and basically give them the capabilities to record the everyday, reconfigure what they're recording, and then put out an interesting way of telling their stories. So what I want to talk a little bit about is what is not story. So actually, when you follow the history of objects, the approach to history is either there is a wear and tear, right? You can see the patina. You can see the aging on objects. And then there's the provenance, which is a record of ownership. But however, this is not story. These are markers of time. These are a way that we can talk about story or t uh, excuse me, tell stories, right? So I can tell you a story about probably that graffiti on the tree. You know, it's probably two lovers who had a fight, but then they reconciled and they decide to mark their love for each other. So that's a little story about them. However, the representation is not story. So in parallel, I took this idea and I've done uh, some social visualization research. And uh, I visualized uh, discussion threads. And so what happens is my goal was to um, represent communities, the impression of what was going on in those uh, threaded discussions. And so again here, these are mappings and representations of threads. It's almost you know, artistic, right? And perhaps the reading is only for me. And here's an example. So this is one of the visualizations. It's very straightforward. And I was interested in using motion to uh, represent the energy in the conversations. And I visualized 50 threads that happened on 9-11. And you can tell by the left thread, there's a lot of activity going on because of the movement that you see, right? But on the right, you see that the movement is really slow meaning that the conversations that's going back and forth is much slower. So again, what I want to point out here is that this is not story. This is a mapping. This is a representation. So next, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk a little bit about different aspects of what we need to make story in design. So first, story needs motion. So motion is uh, not about movement, just the way you saw you know, the threads moving. But I'm talking about motion in the sense that there needs to be a progression of events. So I don't know if you've read The Hero's Journey by Joseph Campbell. It's the idea where you know, this ordinary man was chosen to go into this extraordinary world to save the world. So he has to make this big leap of faith into this special world to fight the villain. And he comes back to his normal world, and he becomes a hero. And so there's this progression of events, of movement. So that's what I mean by motion. As an example of motion, what I did was I collaborated with uh, this writer named Richard Castellanos. Um, his, he's very profoundly uh, self-centric. He's very characteristic. When he replies an email to you, he writes, writes in all bold caps. So when he actually writes in lowercase, it's actually like he respects you. It's a very special thing. But um, he's quite a character. He lives in a New York loft near you know, uh, Soho. And uh, he has thousands and thousands of books in his apartment. It's, it's really surprising and great. And he surrounds himself with words, and he plays with words. So my task was to, how do you visualize an ob object space? So what I did was I visualized him without him actually being there through an apartment space that you know, really tried to represent a story about him. So how do I represent story using motion? Well, the idea is that when you first go to this installation, you see a lot of you see a lot of motion, right? You see a lot of things moving. But the idea is that uh, 
the writer is actually online and you can asynchronously communicate with them so that there's an evolving landscape in this apartment. So the next time you visit the space, the information is really changing based on you know, his diary entry, his correspondence with the e exhibition uh, viewers. So a little bit about these two videos is essentially what I wanted to do is I wanted to juxtapose the old writing mechanism with the new computer. Excuse me? Yes, I did. Yes. I had collaborators in the production side, but all the details were mine. Yep. Okay. So that's about motion. You need a progression. So this was about the evolving landscape. Next, in order to have story, you need character. You know, in a great movie, you know, the narrative really drives the movie, right? But you need also the actor. You need a really good character who's strong, who could deliver that narrative, right? So in parallel, we have to look at technology. How can technology interface story in the sense that it is a character? So this is a scenario where a little boy is going on a ride with his mom. So in this uh, picture, he's a little bit you know, scared. And what's happening is he's seeing that his mother's seat, the driving seat, is actually turning red, possibly a sign of frustration or some emotion change, right? But at the same time, from the object's point of view, it's starting to reveal the history of this little kid, what he's been up to. He's not wearing his seat belt. He's probably jumping around in the back seat. So probably that's the story about him, you know, really upsetting his mother. So to visualize this, what I've done is I've created an electronic fabric. And this was in collaboration with a car company named Collins and Aikman. And basically what happens is when you touch the fabric, it can read, it can read uh, the points. And basically it can also draw out you know, pictures. So the idea is that it can acquire the history and it can express the history. So the idea is that there's a fabric stops per inch so that you can actually you know, put, have an output that can draw images. And the gray squares are where it can basically measure the pressure and where you touched. So again, it's inevitable, inevitable that you know, we need input and out, out, output in technology. We don't want to put an LCD in the back of your car seat, right? How do you design technology so that it's more integrative in, in the way we interface and interact with our spaces? So next, story needs implicit point of views. So when I say the king died and the queen died, it's very explicit what happened. But what if I said the king died and the queen died with grief? It allows you to start to think about all the other aspects the queen might have gone through. So there, there's a lot of causal relations of, of how the events are linked together. So what I've done is I looked at the experience cycle of a greeting card. So what's so special about a card, right? So the current state of the, you know, like a birthday card is that, you know, I'm going to write a birthday card to Curtis and say, happy birthday, Curtis. You know, I hope you have a really good year. And I send it to him. So he receives it. And, you know, the moment he receives it, he's happy, joyful. And that's about it. You know, he can call me back. Thanks for the card, right? So what I've done is that what if we can actually loop back this experience so that, you know, whatever Curtis or any, the person who receives the card can, you know, say, well, you know, this was really special, you know, and I really appreciate that. So it's really bridging the experience back. So to make this clear, here's my scenario. So Kathy, she basically receives a card from me because she invited me to her house for dinner. And I really appreciated it. I said, thanks, Kathy, really. And so what happens is when she opens the card, it captures the moment that she opens. So possibly when I open the card, you can be laughing, or you can be just very quiet, or you could be reading. So what happens is it captures the audio, and it, it transmits that audio into you know nearby computer, and it gets sent back to the person who sent the card. So in this scenario, 
you know, I put a middle interface so that, you know, you have the option to edit, trim the audio that's been captured, right? In case there's something that you want to add to it or, you know, take out from the audio. But, you know, in the future, you can imagine that, you know, you open the card and it captures that moment, but that moment can actually be transferred all the way back, you know, without having it edited. And how would that change the experience of cards or future objects? So, so what, what I'm trying to say here is that uh, these implicit point of views are very context-bounded, right? This only happens when, you know, the card is open. It's not uh, recording everything else that's happening, but it only happens because it's in relation to the function and the form of the object. Next, story needs continuity. So here I'm talking about how we need thematic continuity, visual continuity, temporal continuity, so that we can actually make sense of story. So, you know, if I were to see a film uh, about how a person was sitting on a chair all his life and suddenly saw oranges drop from a tree, it doesn't really make sense, right? So we need some kind of thematic continuity or even temporal continuity that really bridges these events together. So what I did with um, Bill Mitchell is um, I, this is actually in IMAX format, and uh, he worked uh, directly with Gary, so he knows a lot about the Stata building. This is the C-cell building at MIT. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to capture from the camera lens view of what the life of the building was like. So this is a traditional photo time lapse. But you start thinking, well, you know, it's really great that you can capture all this history and you could get a sense of a day's worth of stories. But then what is story? Well, we need to know, you know, what is special and not special about the day. Because if you start recording these time lapses over days and days, you know, probably people visiting the space, you know, it might be, you know, very common. So how do you allow a system to determine what is extraordinary and ordinary, within the ordinary? This is a cafeteria. Yeah, you can see that at, M at MIT we eat very fast. <laughs> so even in this cafeteria scenario, you know, how do you start to say, well, you know, the system is listening to a lot of chair moving noises or a lot of chatter from all that noise? You know, how do you start to say, well, this is really special because someone is starting to sing or, you know, the light is very dark because this actually, this architecture is very based on how the light moves through the building. So, so what we're going to do is now is we're going to step back a little bit and uh, we're going to think about how story fits into design. So just so that everyone is on the same grounds of understanding what design is, is design is about making sense of things that considers people, spaces, and objects. So the current traditional design thinking is that we think that there is form and function. Form is the way it communicates safety. Form is the way it can communicate beauty. Form is basically the visible language, right? Then there is a functional aspect which is, you know, is it a fit product? You know, is the utilitarian, is the role, does it meet the goal of what it's supposed to do? So where does story fit in? Story, what I've done, it, I've done here is I've basically extended the model to include time. Because to have story, you need temporal progression. So what is time? Time breaks down into three elements which is transaction stance and the teller system. Transactions is about the provenance. So the provenance <coughs> is what I mentioned before is the record of ownership, but now I'm saying that we can include the everyday. So it's not only about <coughs> ownership, but it's all, all about the other aspects. Stance is about the voice of the object. You know, what is the attitude the object will take upon the world, right? You know, is it going to like the light? Or is it going to really say, oh, you know, you know, that person really enjoys me, you know, from an object point of view. And we need a story machine, the teller system, which is essentially the 
underlying architecture that really makes everything work. So now I'm going to go into detail what each of these elements mean. Transactions. So transactions, again, is about now including records of the everyday. So the idea is that when you are continuously recording events, you have an active experience, right? And when you look back upon all those records, you have an abstraction of experience. And the key point of this is that you can actually, as a designer, you can actually control the granularity of these recordings. So you have to consider all the different contexts. You know, for example, the Stata building that I showed you, does it make sense that I capture each event every 10 seconds? Or does it make sense that I only capture events when people walk by? So how do you control that granularity between each record? <coughs> Stance is about the voice, the attitude, the object looks out into the world. And here you can start to apply narrative <coughs> attributes, such as what is the intent of the object? What is the point of view it wants to have upon the object? And you know, what is the continuity? You know, how does it bring temporal continuity into story? And what happens is when you start applying these narrative attributes, what happens is you can start to distinguish what is extraordinary within the ordinary. And the reason why I have the two um, squares dotted is because not all events stay extraordinary, right? If, say, like today is my first day in Seattle, actually, and there's it's a lot of fog, right? So it's very extraordinary to me. But what if I'm here visiting for a week and it's foggy throughout the whole week? Then those events, you know, start to become very ordinary, right? So, so you know, you, you have to ask the system, you know, what is the intent? What is the point of view? And how do you bring this thematic continuity and temporal continuity so that we can distinguish what is special and not special. The teller system is the underlying architecture of what makes the story work. And so we obviously need an input and output. And we also need a mechanism in the system that allows it to reconfigure whatever you're recording. And you also need you know, a database of synthetic memory so that you can really access past memory to distinguish, further distinguish what is special and not special. And what's important about the teller system is that you need a feedback loop. So what I mentioned at the very beginning of this talk, you know, the, the same story will never be the same again because you have this feedback loop. So you can tell by reading in all the input, you know, the output will be different. So looking back on how these uh, different elements work together, um, it's very important that you have to recognize that each element is not separate, but they're actually interlinked with all the other elements. So they, so they don't work in isolation. So again, <coughs> time is about the c controlling the granularity of the recordings. It's the voice, the attitude the object takes upon the world and you need a feedback loop, a system that can basically continuously understand what's happening around this context. So taking, um, taking this framework, um, I try to uh, apply as um, the foundations of this framework to into an example. And this is my exa uh, extensive example of the audio bench. So this bench actually lives outside in front of our lab. And what it does is it continuously records its life through audio. And what happens is when somebody sits on the bench, uh, basically you get to hear a story about what is experienced. So the reason why I chose audio is because audio is very time evoking. You have the ability to compress audio in a special way. And here's an example of you know, what the bench experienced. This, so this is one story, right? It, because all stories are not the same. This is one story of the bench. <laughs> 
So it's actually, um, it's very quiet though, and you heard a lot of bird noise and other sounds, different sounds. But it's actually very representative of this environment. So, you know, because that area is actually very quiet. This was uh, during the summer, this past summer. So the idea is that it records audio, it compresses, and this is what I call audio time lapse, and it plays back a compression of its history. So I'm going to talk a little bit of how it works. Uh, no, it wasn't. It was compressed. So uh, actually, later after the talk, I can play back the raw audio of what is linear. And obviously, you can imagine it's really long and a lot of ambient sound. So that's sort of like the greatest hits of the day. Well, maybe and maybe not. Because again, it's, it's going back to the football example where I said, you know, you know, seeing the highlights during the evening news is about highlights, looking at highlights. But that's not story, right? is how do you actually you know, pick out events that are very relevant to its point in time and its situation. So how do we? How do you distinguish those? That I mean, presumably the broadcaster who's giving me the highlights of the game is trying to give me the best possible five minutes and that he can of the game. Right, I mean. It is the yeah. most unusual things, the most distinct things, the most story things. Right. And it is a story. I mean, it, yeah, of course, it, it is a story. However, it's a very, uh, it's very uh, framed with a sports editor, right? So, I mean, the thing is about sports, there's a lot of different facets and elements that you know, make a story. And so how do you actually frame it so that, you know, it's generic enough, but then it's woven in an interesting way where we can take away stories so that it's not really single-handed someone's point of view. Right? And then there's all these other subtle elements, which is what I call the implicit point of view in the football game, for example. Because you know, the sports editor can actually say, well, you know, you know uh, what's his name? Kurt, Kurt Manning? No, Pey Peyton, right? Uh, you know, his energy was running low through the beginning of the game, just like the game in the Patriots. But in the second round, you know, the, his energy turned up and there was a lot of game strategy. But, you know, apparently, you know, people observed that he was eating a lot of bananas, you know. But, you know, those things, you know, how do you actually weave those kind of special events together? Sure. So, uh, just to exhaust this interesting thread. So, I understand, of course, with the highlights that there is a bias. So, so there is a specific point of view that transpires and emerges. What is different, though, about this compression? What are the criteria? Who defines the criteria? Yeah, so I want to talk about like, okay. how this bench works. So and then we could continue this thread of discussion. Because this is a very interesting research question. So uh, what happens is, you know, over time, you know, when you revisit the bench, uh, the story will always be different because time progresses. So the idea is that today, the bench will tell me all about these things, right? And the red square is, you know, what was most special today. But it's, it, what happens is over time, it's only going to remember the only really special things. So it starts to weave out and not remember. So it's, it's the idea that, you know, like I can remember my 14th uh, birthday, right? Because that was really special in my life. Quick question, so is there a motion sensor? How do you know when you sit down? Or you oh, the yeah, I'm going to go into it. <laughs> Uh, so, so in order for the bench to tell a story, we obviously need speakers. And uh, in order for it to experience story and the context, you need microphones, right? And in order to tell story, you need you know, sensors. And here in this specific example, I use IR sensors. So it can detect whether someone is sitting on the bench or someone is not sitting on the bench. But the idea is that when someone is sitting on the bench and talking, the bench is continuously recording. But if you are quiet, for now it's set at 10 seconds. So if you're actually quiet for 10 seconds, the bench will start to tell you its story. So another thing that's important to consider, and I've uh, debated of whether I should include this slide, is that um, system design is not only about software, but you have to also uh, consider the actual hardware, right? So this example, because of time constraint, I had to um, base it off on an existing bench. But it's the idea that you, know, you have to create a physical experience that is really 
you know, relevant to what a bench is. You can't just, you know, put on speakers and microphones anywhere, right? So what I've done here is basically try to create this embodiment of, you know, storytelling. So it's like an arm wrapping around the bench. As for the system, so you need sensors, right? Be so that it can tell when someone is sitting on the bench and someone is not sitting on the bench, whether it should be, you know, recording or whether it should be playing back a story. So there's a recording module and a playback module. And then there's a database where it stores the events. So what happens is, is that in the recording module, what we want to determine is the biggest change in the audio signal. So what happens is you're continuously recording the audio stream. And then you know, we obtain the descriptors, the audio signature based on the frequency content. And that's based on uh, Tristan's work at the Media Lab on the simple psychoacoustic model. And then uh, the next part is basically noticing where all these onset changes are. And that's where I you know, basically determine and define what an event is. And once you start segmenting the events, then I store the event with, along with a timestamp as well as the audio signature. And then so we have that you know, in the back of our memory. And then as for the playback, what happens is you can you know, enter in your system, well, I want the bench to tell me stories about an entire month, right? So you have a time range. So it retrieves the events from memory. And then based on, it, we cluster the events together based on the similarity on the audio signature, the frequency content. And then we sort, and basically what happens is, you know, when you cluster, you know, they group together. But so those events that fall away from the center of each cluster determines that they're very extraordinary. So based on that, I sort it in a list between what is ordinary to what is very special. And then I go through a time, life, a time lapse construction and weaving these events together. So I'm going to talk a little bit later about how I weave these events together. So first, um, I'm going to talk about the study I did uh, about the bench. There are two parts. The first part was I asked two audio experts to experience the world as the bench experienced it. So what they did was they sat out with the bench in the open, blindfolded, and they listened to the world. And at the same time, the bench was recording the same audio. And afterwards, they were asked back to, into the lab, and they were asked to construct a story based on what they experienced. So they were giving that raw audio that the bench uh, recorded. So one key thing that came out of this part of the study is, apart from having you know, eight samples, four samples from human construction and a machine construction, uh, basically Roberto, the second audio expert, he said, well, on the first day, everyone was coming up to me and said, what are you doing? Why are you blindfolded? So you know, in his first stories, there's a lot of events that included those conversations. But towards the end of the week, he didn't include them at all. It's because those events become very ordinary because you know, it's not special anymore. So what happened in their results is that both of them uh, had a mannerism of how to group events together. So um, they both chronologically grouped them as time went by of what they remembered. So for example, they remembered, well, at the beginning of my experience, I heard a boy start bouncing balls. And then at the second, uh, and, and afterwards, I heard a lot of people walking by and laughing at me. So they included that in a chronological manner. So what I did was I translated this uh, to our system design. So first I started out, well, let's weave between what is most and least ordinary to what is most ordinary. And what I found out through uh, user studies is that everything sounded the same. So you can't. Because you, know, you really want to highlight the extraordinary, but because you're putting the most ordinary things in between, it just sounds important. So what we had to do is basically we had to weave the events, not black and red, but we had to weave it, uh, weave it with orange, the in between the less extraordinary events. And so it's, it's almost like animation tweening, so you can actually understand what's happening and what is special. It really focuses on uh, what is extraordinary. We also um, looked at uh, how uh, our system did in, in basically distinguishing 
uh, extraordinary events. So uh, these two audio experts were asked to um, look at a window. So they're, they have two neighborhoods. They, they are looking at a neighborhood range, and they're determining what is special in the audio. So basically, the top 50% was 72% of all the events they thought it was special. So you know, all the events they thought uh, matched our top 50%. Oops, sorry. So the next part is about, you know, what are the impressions of how people experience the storied object? Because there isn't a storied object yet, and this is the audio bench. So I did a before interview and an after interview, and in between they also listened to uh, the eight human and machine construction time lapses. And so before the, they listened to it, I asked them, so what do you think story is, and uh, how do you think you know, a story uh, object should be like? And one person said, well, I'll be very concerned what my bed would tell me, right? And then another person said, well, I can't imagine an object to tell me a story because you know, I can imagine my refrigerator telling me information what the weather is or if there's food inside the refrigerator. And then the third person said, uh, well, you know, I think that you know, there should be someone actually talking, you know, like a, literally a person talking out of the bench. And afterwards, uh, so after they experienced the bench, what happened was, you know, most of the people were very much impressed that you can actually compress time like that. And more importantly, what happened was it really situated the object in the environment. So when they were actually s listening and you know, sitting on the bench when I was telling a story, uh, they were understanding the uh, environment more. So it's not about that there were birds chirping or there were squirrels or there were dogs barking, but it really situated them in a space that they can only imagine of. So again, um, 12 people, six women and six men. Um, I flipped the order to you know, consider any biases, whether they, if, in case they heard machine time lapses first as opposed to human time lapses. So basically, you know, I tallied you know, how well they did in determining you know, whether it was a machine construction or a human construction. And the important thing here is I'm not trying to mimic our system to create a human story but I want the system to make a story that is just as impressionable as humans. And what I found out is that in the stories, when there were a lot of ambient sounds, here and there, they were able to determine very successfully that it was a machine that made the story. But then, when they heard a lot of human voices, they were kind of, they didn't really know whether it was a machine or a human. So we wanted to discriminate, basically, you know, are humans prone to being convinced that a human perhaps made the story when there were human voices present? And statistically, it says that, yeah, sure. But, you know, when there's human constructions, you know, uh, it's not statistically significant. It's like a 50-50, basically. But we can say that, you know, when there are human voices, you know, people relate to it more. That's why they start to be more convinced that it could perhaps be a human who made the story. I was also interested in learning about the perceived time of the time lapse. So the actual length of the time lapse range from 4 minutes to 7 minutes to 50 seconds. And it's a representation of a one hour raw audio track, right? These squares are where most of the uh, votes were tallied. And the red square represents where you know, the majority it thought the perception of time was. And it's interesting, again, because with ambient sound, people thought it was like six hours long, a representation of six hours long, or they couldn't really understand it. They thought it was really dry and boring. But when it had human voices, people thought it was an average around between 30 minutes to an hour, which is you know, closer to what the representation of the raw one hour, hour audio was. So I didn't actually understand yeah. this, this graph. So the, um, so, so the, <coughs> the yellow dots are actually what 
So the yellow dots are the time lapse. So you would hear like a five minute time lapse. Okay. But all the time lapses are, have been compressed from a one hour raw audio, okay. right? And so these squares are what they thought it was a representation of. So like for example, this person might have thought that, yeah, I think it's a 50 second uh, representation. It's a one to one, right? Or someone might think that it's, you know, six hours when it was, it was only a one hour compression. What are, the, what are the multiple vertical lines within each create bar? You mean these? Okay, so so I'm just trying to understand what's in the plot. So so like in the in in each in each vertical grouping, like a gray, white, or dark gray bar, those are like multiple runs. Oh no 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 no! I was just trying to separate because the point here is that here um, people were closer to the one hour radio, uh, raw audio perception, right? But here it's it's about ambient and people didn't make sense of it or they thought it was really dry and boring. But each vertical line is one person or each square is one person? Oh, it's not a one-to-one -one representation. It's oh. a relative. So the red means that there's the majority of it falls. That means it's fi over 50%. Okay. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, um, so basically now I'm gonna play back Star Wars audio time-lapse. Um, this actually, uh, captures what the system does. So everyone is aware of the audio time, uh, uh, Star Wars, right? So what I'm going to play back is 90 seconds, a compression of five minutes. So first I'm going to play a little bit of what you would originally or normally hear. So, you know, the 20th Century Fox. Okay, so here's 90 seconds of Star Wars. So the idea is that, you know, if you put the bench like in front of a church or if you put the bench, you know, in a supermarket, it can tell different stories because obviously its context is different and our system is able to compress these uh, depending on, uh, you know, how the situation is into its own story format. So you had a question? Yeah, so it's, is it more accurate to call it splicing than compression because when you say compression, I'm thinking Right. So I don't actually, technically, I don't like using the word uh, <coughs> uh, compression. I like using the word foreshortening because it's not about just, you know, cutting it and then putting, back, putting them back together. But it's, you know, so this audio time lapse is actually an episodic narrative because there's different story forms, right? There's the typical causal relation stories that we see in movies. But here is, is a picaresque episodic so what's happening is you're really you know listening to the key things that happened 
Um, yeah. Um, if you had a human editor that was compressing or foreshortening the first five minutes, I yeah. think they might go by visual cues or, you know, quotes in the movie or some things that might be memorable. And I was wondering how that compares to your machine foreshortening and what the metrics were you used to, to decide what pieces to choose. Well, uh, well, as for the bench, you know, like in the study, uh, the audio experts were blindfolded. It's because I wanted to, you know, basically make a parallel compar comparison because the bench is only listening to audio. Because when you start, you know, integrating all these visual patterns, then it's a whole different, you know, category, right? There's no visual cue, right. it's primarily audio cue, and in the audio cue, how do you sort of decide what segments to that are significant or extraordinary? Is it because there's some clustering related to Right, it? it's clustering and time, a timestamp because it's not about what was most special about today, but because time is about progression. Right now the window is like 10 seconds, so what was most special in 10 seconds? So that's how it achieves, so that based on the frequency content. The 10 seconds was uh, arbitrary? Yeah, you can change that. But uh, the reason why I have 10 seconds is it actually works very well outside. Yeah, when I actually, I actually put like Julia Child's recipe uh, TV show, you can't use 10 seconds. You have to use a smaller frame. So, so, um, so what I stated at the very beginning of the talk was that my goal is to try to support story exchange, storytelling, and uh, create this man and machine partnership because I don't believe that machines should take over and tell me what's happening, but machines should have the capabilities of telling me enough so that I can take away and make meaning out of that. So what I've shown you today is the idea of storied objects, that they have the basic current state has the basic capabilities of you know, recording their experience, reconfiguring their, what they recorded, and outputting, storytelling, what they experienced. And what I also did was basically you know, we don't have current objects that have history within themselves so, uh, apart from wear and tear. So it's the idea that we integrate a history within the object. And also that you know, it's very important to, you know, put the extraordinary and really distinguish what is special within certain points of context. And in parallel, the audio time lapse com uh, compression, the foreshortening technique does that. It takes in audio streams, is able to uh, use existing algorithms, and currently our system is made so that you know, we can always you know, collaborate with computer scientists who's done you know, groundbreaking work on audio scene analysis. And then, so that, and then the audio uh, compression happens by putting them together. So the takeaway that uh, I want you to take away is that um, story is about exchange. Story is a very powerful thing because through story, we're able to remember things better. Through story, we're able to comprehend things better. Through story, we can communicate better. Uh, story binds information to intention. So, you know, for example, you know, when you search something, you're not just going to get a list of things, right? Because I'm sure, you know, there's really novel techniques that say, say for example, I say, well, what is the, you know, most special chocolate house in Seattle, right? And probably, you know, a search engine will probably give me a list. But from the, you have to consider from the listener, the human side. You know, for me, sure, I can trust that the first entry is perhaps most popular or most relevant, right? But how do you make that information presentable so that it becomes more relevant to me and so that I can obtain more meaning? It's not just a list. It's something that I can remember throughout. So my next steps, my future work, includes really about how do you frame information? You know, how do you frame information when, you know, you have all these different contexts? And it's not only about objects, but it's also about systems. And what the narrative themes that I want to uh, look at is,
how can we build systems that you know really support that reflective process and you know improvisation is is a big thing because you know personally I don't know what I'm gonna do next right so how do systems support that and then what happens when you have all these other point of views you know how does it become more rich your experience so essentially the idea of storied storied objects is that it's not about form and function of an object, what you can do with it, but it's a more appreciative and engaging interaction. So I'll leave you with the thought that, you know, what would these objects tell you about its life? What would the lipstick tell you about its life? So I'm open to discussion, going back. So. you had on the uh, 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 takeaways on storytelling was story binds information to intention. Yeah. Can you tell me where in your work the intention aspect is? Um, well, the intention is actually, uh, actually very mild, to be honest. But uh, it's the idea, for example, in the card. My, as a designer, I can say, well, the design, the intention of this story is that it will only record the first five seconds of that experience. But if the card is closed, it won't care, right? So if the card is opened again, it will never you know, record again. Because there's actually a story that came on CNN last year about these two brothers. They exchanged the same birthday card for 29 years. And each birthday, they would add one line. So imagine, imagine this birthday card. You know, it's full of memories, but it's the single object. So their intent was that, you know, let's, you know, really make this special day special and also look back on time. So it's, it's, it's about how do you frame, you know, what is your intention? What do you want the user to gain out of the experience? of purpose or intention, right, other than just t time duration. Right? Like that, if you're the center of the card, mm -hmm. you may have had an intent to make the person feel, feel special or humor or I just wonder right. if you've thought about any more. If, if, if intention is really a key part of storytelling, is there more that could be done? Hmm. Well, <laughs> let me think on that, okay? <laughs> because, uh, Intent, uh, intent is actually one of the key factors that drive story, right? Even when you look at movies, what was the intent? And when you start talking about purpose, you start to start to think about, remember I showed you the form, function, and time. Then you start to ask, you know, what is the value of purpose, right? right. And so, I mean, I've had questions in the past. You know, what's the value of storied objects? You know, who cares if objects told you stories, right? But you know, in a very, you know, appreciative sense, you know, like, for example, um, Ikea, you know how, you know, you can buy these furniture at a really low cost, and, you know, if they wear down, you can buy another one. But if you had some kind of storytelling mechanism, you know, perhaps you want to keep, you know, the object a little longer than, you know, buying the next new car that comes out, right? Yeah. So... I, asked a, I see a corollary between some of your work, and one of the things that we're trying to do is we capture large amounts of user data about their experiences with our products mm -hmm. in the form of s system events. Right. But normally the killer thing in being able to tell stories around that data is being able to derive the intention behind the, the right. actions. And I just wondered if you had yeah. thought any more. Well, I think a way to also think about it is really consider the teller and the listener. Right? So again, like what you said, you know, what was that experience of that user? So how do you, you know, build this interface that really captures a certain type of, you know, what, what that context is from the user side, right? And then how does the system support that context? And again, that context is always changing. That's very important.
Sorry, two things. The first one is on one of your last slides, you said this this was about exchange. Yeah. I think of exchange as being two-way. Two-way communication, of so, course. You know, say I sit down on the bench on day one, then on day five someone else sits down on the bench and, and says something or does something. How do I get back what they did? Well, well, the idea is that right now it's about that it's it is capturing, so it's not explicit. And it's not exchange. Well, it is exchange because it, your the experience that it recorded a couple of days later is embodied inside that all those events, right? right but exchange. Oh. It has to come back to me for it to be an exchange. But it it will it would be included in the story if it was special enough, right? So I guess I guess you're talking about, you know, how do you make it more explicit, right? All I'm saying is I sat down on day one, <coughs> day five, someone sat down, something interesting happened. How am I ever gonna know about that or get that back? Are you gonna send me an email saying, hey, something interesting happened on the bench? Or are you gonna send me an email that says, hey, come sit down on the bench, something interesting happened? That, well, that was a reflection yeah, of the input right. that you gave on day one. Right, and that ties to, again, that ties, that ties to more the functional. If you want some messaging system like that, sure, you can do that. But it's, it's more the poetry and the aesthetic that I want to capture in this particular example. Okay, sure. Yeah. So that when you put on your slide exchange, yeah. you're careful about why you put that on there because that, that connotes a lot to me, especially right. in this age of MySpace and, and yeah. you, know, you know the Zoom and people wanting to send right. things back and forth. Yeah. There has to be a back channel. Yeah. Well, I guess, I guess it's also, I mean, I think, thanks for your uh, feedback. And I guess also it's, it's, it's more of my bigger you know, goals of vision, right? It, and the audio time lapse and the audio bench and all the other examples are only you know, a few steps I've taken towards this vision. So thanks. And then the other comment yep. was uh, you talk a lot about stories and you talk about sort of elevating the ordinary through the extraordinary. No, ordinary, extraordinary within the ordinary. Yep. Right. So what I thought interesting, when you, first, when you played the first audio clip from the bench, mm -hmm. You know, even though those were machine picked, right. right? That sample, I thought that it, for me, it was very evocative. Mm -hmm. Like I could picture myself there. I could picture the day, even though those events weren't particularly extraordinary. Right. So then it makes me think of other experiences like that are very evocative, like right. being on the beach, watching the waves. There's nothing extraordinary about one wave versus another wave, or, or a cloud that goes over a seagull. But yet, that a snippet, uh, when you foreshorten snippet is very extraordinary. So I think what I'm trying to say is that saying that it has to be extraordinary avoid, extraordinary events may preclude a focus on things that are really wonderful. Sure. And, and I guess it's also uh, very much tied to that particular bench in space and time, right? That makes it evocative and special to that bench, well, right? I think, actually, I think I'm saying something different. I think I'm saying what was wonderful to me was almost the generic nature of the information I got back, that I didn't have to have ever been on that bench in that particular place. It reminded me of sitting in the sun, you know, maybe mm -hmm. in my backyard as a kid. If, you, if, it, if I had started hearing people speak, and they were speaking in Japanese or Korean, because that's people who are sitting there, then it would have lost that generic appeal to me. Mm -hmm even though those were extraordinary events. Right. So what was nice is that it actually sort of blurred out all of the, uh, the very specifics. Well, I, I guess um, in your view, I think it's actually a nice uh, feedback. But I think like had you know, there been like certain different ethnicities talking on the bench, I think that would have been included in that space. And uh, sure, your experience of it would have been different, but you know we can't change. Well, well, again, like my intent for the bench was to really tell us about this every day, right? Not about the ambient sound or what the natural feel of the environment was. And sure, you can frame it that way. So, question. Okay. Okay. Maybe I'm taking something too literal because you, you move back and forth from like the object is telling a story, like your last slide, you're saying, oh, I'm really curious what stories the object would tell. 
versus like I am receiving a story or I am communicating a story as in a human. So I'm not really like your design system. Is it who is it you're designing, or is it the object itself, or is it? Yeah, it's very object centric right now. Okay, so it is so it's so you want to have so the object tells its story. Yeah. Okay. And. And I do want in the future to consider the human model in, in there, you know, because that will change it, right? Right now it's all about, if I'm the object, you know, I'm, re I'm basically experiencing what's happening and I want to tell you about it. But I'm not, and the state of it right now is that I'm not considering what you're thinking, right? I'm just telling you what happened. So it's not, it's not about a foreshortening or compression about what it was about, but it's about what happened. And that's why it's an episodic narrative. So, so why is it the bench would hear then? Because it doesn't, it's like if I were a bench, mm -hmm. right, I wouldn't necessarily hear, right? I mean, most of my function and structural is really on supporting people, right? Yeah, but so the audio bench is just an example. You can imagine different types of sensing, right? You know, how would the stories change when it's about, you know, just touch, right? Or you combine touch and hearing. So, um, I think uh, I'm building up actually on what he was saying. I think there's a sort of uh, probably um, more or less intentional anthropomorphization of because the bench does not have ears, so objects do not have those kind of sensory uh, fed information. So we may also decide though at the same time to have future. Actually, what was the last visual? One? Visual, yes. So the bench could see. Right. At some point, I can tell visual stories as well. Right. So it, I see it very um, flexible, but not necessarily. It's very hard to be completely object oriented. Yeah, I agree. I agree. <laughs> and I think partly it's because, you know, even when someone's designing a park, you know, there's a reason why a certain type of bench is used. There's a reason why trees are planted in a certain way. So I do agree that, I mean, for me, where the research is, I really want to bring in the human model and see how we can frame the story so that there's more of an exchange there. So. One, one other question, where do you see the idea of ritual and cultural ritual since you know, you've been, your interest in the culture so ritual is really important right. come into play? This is oftentimes ritual forms around an object, say like a goblet handled during a church procession, a wedding ring. Um, there are certain rituals around these objects that have very little to do with the actual object, yet they imbue the body with incredible meaning, like the painting that is handled that is saved from fire or you know, even the chair. Right. Yeah, so so particular. So actually, you know, one of the very first inspirations was like back in the early thirties during the Industrial Revolution, um, I think his name was Calkins. He's the a, a person who actually started the whole thing about, well, next year we're gonna come up with a new model car. So he started the trend where it's not about whether <coughs> you know, your, your object can last, but it's, it's about new modeling. So I got frustrated with that idea because it's people have their own rituals, right? And during the mass, you know, industrial revolution, it, when everything was mass produced, people started to create their own culture, even though they had the same object because they wanted to be unique and different. So I think, you know, we have to, you know, build technology that, you know, factors in those different types I mean, a lot of meaning is very subjective and it's, it's cognitive too. But if there are ways that we can actually translate that into tangible means so that the object can actually capture that and express that, and I think it's a very, I think that that is closer to the vision in the long run, so. so do you see sort of personal experiences with products being somehow uh, embedded in the project, products themselves as part of sharing who they are and what they are. I mean, I was thinking of an example from your conversation. There's a, a Wii, and the, what, what Nintendo did with the Wii is they had this website where they videotaped all these people's experiences with using the Wii and sort of bring the light of the person 
and they had put all of this on the website. Now, most people that, if they didn't look on the, the website, they wouldn't necessarily know about that. But if somebody was seeing the weed for the first time on the shelf, and they could see the delight and experience or the stories of people in using a product, I could see how that could really transform it from being just a box to just another sort of category of a project by being a video console to one where you see the personal experience of that particular object. Yeah. I mean, I think we is a great example because it provides a platform where people can really hack with and do their own thing. And the nice thing about adding story is that it really personalizes it. And, you know, and then when, when these personalized we like future we remotes, controls start to share their experiences, you know, it will probably evolve the other we's, right? It's, it's like um, the idea I mentioned before is, you know, when you're really sad and you, you're the only person in the world, you know, how do you know you're sad until you start talking to people, right? And you start sharing those ideas and you start realizing that you're sad. So, you know, in object terms, you know, if it has capabilities of sharing, it, it, makes, it makes it a deeper, it's, it's about appreciation and engagement. And it's, it broadens your perspective, right? Uh, there's one last quote that, that I, I think that people should also take away is Kosalek. Um, his his uh, basic quote is, there is no future if there is no past or present, right? And this idea of storytelling and story making is based on that because you need to continually experience to move forward, right? To make sense of it. And through story, you can do that. So. Thank you very much. Thank you.